Um, in talking about Project One, we did tell you that there are some websites we don't want you to use. Okay, so which websites are good to use? If it ends in edu, that's usually a good website. Okay, dot gov can be a good website. I don't know that you're going to find a whole lot about psychologists on a dot gov website or um, dot org is usually pretty good. I would. It's better to stick with this one, but. NC Live, obviously, but even in NC Live, you still want to put that you want a scholarly source. Okay, that's really important for this one. And why do we make you find scholarly sources? Why? Because you're when you transfer to university or when you take other courses here, it's important that you use scholarly sources. Not People Magazine. Psychology Today is great reading. It is not a scholarly source. Okay. And if you decide to write about somebody, you can use your book. And it may even be that if you look, if you look in the book and there's a citation, you may be able to go to the back of the book and find a reliable source that way about that particular psychologist. Any questions about Project 2? Okay. What, what is it this week? Everybody's just kind of blah. Oh. It's not me. Or you're not going to say that even if it is. Okay. Okay. So let's look at Chapter 9. What is emerging adulthood? I read the chapter. <laughs> I'm not supposed to call you out like that. Okay. Early adulthood or emerging adulthood may be the stage of development that a lot of you are in right now. Everybody keeps telling you you need to be more responsible and now you're an adult and you need to make good decisions and be responsible and prepared for consequences of your own behavior, but yet are you always treated as an adult? Mm -hmm. You are not? No, right. I mean, when I was in college, you know, I lived at home during the summer, and when I went home for the weekends or whatever, I was still expected to follow the same rules and expectations which was very difficult when you lived on campus and then done things however you want, and then you come home and you have to obey those rules. Right? I mean, I was still expected to always be home by 11 p.m. I was a college student. I was 21. But if I was gonna live in that house, because my parents were from, the, they, they definitely used the authoritative parenting style, which is one of the parenting styles we talked about, and they always explained why they had that. My dad's first explanation is nothing good ever happens after 11 o'clock, so you need to be home. It's also because I was a girl, but um, my dad had to go into work very early, and you know, he didn't want to be kept up past 11 waiting, worrying, or me coming in the house and making a lot of noise. So if I wanted to live there, I had to respect that. So I wasn't treated as an adult necessarily, but I was an adult. I was expected to make good choices and graduate from college, but when I went home, I was treated like a high school student again. So it is kind of confusing, and I think especially in the United States, a lot of cultures handle it very differently. And I think it's even a little more difficult for those of you who are coming to college, but yet also still living at home, and you have to pay for certain things, but you don't have to pay for other things, and it gets, it's kind of difficult to actually become an adult. So we call it emerging adulthood, just in case you're curious about that. 18 to 25, 
I would think that's most of you. Okay. So look on page 252. This is when you're trying to figure out your identity. You're making vital choices in terms of your love lives and your career lives. Is that what you're doing? Hopefully, maybe, possibly. Maybe you're taking this class and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I know I don't want to be a psychologist and I'm never taking another psychology class. Have you found a class that you like, that you were surprised that you liked? Yeah, which one? Yeah, it's not your Stanley. Oh, what doesn't matter. What are you taking? Uh, if you don't mind my asking. It's certificate courses for HVAC. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. HVAC. That's really, you'll make. It's boring and pointless to me, but it's actually interesting. Interesting. Plus, it's also a great field to go into. You get paid quite well. People like to have heat and air conditioning in their homes. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm just curious if you found a class that you just really like that surprised you. Because when students come ask me, it's always good to know. Okay, besides psychology, is there a class that is just, don't tell me if psychology is the class you don't want. Um, is, are there other classes that you're like, okay, this is what I thought I wanted to do, but now that I'm in it, absolutely not. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. So are you just having to get through it, or has it made you change actually your path? Just having to get through it. 168, 169. But is it required for the transfer? Yeah. Okay. But, so it's a struggle because you're thinking, if this is what I'm going to be doing in my career every day, I don't want to do this. But, you know, and you have, to, you have to learn it. You can't just memorize it. Yeah, so it's hard. It's also a stage of instability. How many of you can relate to that? Average is seven different jobs between the ages of 20 and 29. Do you say that's true? I mean, like all the part-time jobs, full-time, you know, you kind of keep with. That is so, that was so unusual many years ago. When my husband got laid off and we had to find another job and move, he got a good job. Well, when he told his parents and his grandparents who were still living at the same time that he was changing jobs, they just were convinced that he had been fired from the other job because they didn't understand why he would change jobs. My dad worked over 30 years at the same plant, Pecker Mill. His dad was a long distance truck driver. He worked for two different companies for over 30 years. People didn't job hop back then. And so it's very hard for the older generation to understand that. Any of you run into that with grandparents or parents? Or It's a good job. Why don't you stay there? It's almost like a loyalty thing. Yeah, with the older generations, but not so much with this. But it, it, can, be, um, it can be unnerving to constantly have to look for another job. <laughs> Romantic partners, I'm not going to ask about that, but this can also be a time when you're trying to figure out you know, what you want out of a relationship, what your expectations are for relationships. Maybe. Um, you may move from place to place with little, if any, furniture. I just found that kind of odd that they put that particular sentence in there. Anyway, age of self-focus. So now you're probably kind of self-focused, especially if you don't have uh, kids yourself, but now you are figuring out who you want to be and not necessarily what your parents expected you to be. The age of feeling in between, and that's kind of what I was talking about. Um, and, but it's also the age of possibilities, right? Don't you feel that? Don't you feel like you just have so many possibilities in front of you once you have this degree? So, um, two terms I wanted to mention that go with adolescence. See if you can relate to either one of these, okay? So, talking about teenagers, um, on page 249, imaginary audience. It's that feeling when you walk into the cafeteria 
that everybody in there is going to look at you and they're going to know you're wearing the same jeans on Thursday that you wore on Monday because you feel like everybody is looking at you. Or if you're having a bad hair day or face break out, you feel like everybody sees it. Did you ever feel that way in high school? Probably had higher self-esteem than some of us. Yeah, I did. I felt that way a lot. But that's not uncommon, and that's one reason they're so self-conscious and they seem so self-centered. It's because they feel as if everybody's watching them. And that's also because starting in ninth and tenth grade, everybody starts asking you, well, what do you want to do when you leave high school? So they're constantly making you focus on yourself and what are your goals and what are your morals and what do you plan to do with the rest of your life? So it's kind of that in-between again where they're, you're still in high school, but yet they're trying to make you start thinking about adult decisions. So you feel like everybody's eyes are on you. My daughter feels that way right now. She applied to seven colleges and, you know, we finally just told, we told all the grandparents that um, she wouldn't hear anything until April, late March or April, because we don't want them constantly asking, have you heard, have you heard, have you heard, and they mean well, but it kind of gets overwhelming when people are constantly asking, right? Um, also, personal fable. Maybe you felt this way in high school if you didn't have, feel like had a imaginary audience. You feel like your feelings and ideas are special, unique, and you're kind of starting to recognize yourself as an individual, and you kind of feel um, untouchable. It was eight students in the bus driver. Who went to the hospital? Eight students in the bus driver. That's okay. Not anyone you know. Well, no relatives? Okay, just ask. All right. I hope they'll all be okay. So, um, so kind of look over that. That's one reason that teenagers seem self self centered. We kind of fuss at them for thinking so much about themselves, but at the same time, we're kind of encouraging them to do that. So it can be kind of confusing. Okay, so we talked a good bit about um, Piaget, a little bit, some object permanence. And then the conservation on page 240, we talked about that. Making sure the kids have the same amount because they don't understand that when you uh, pour the same amount of liquid into a taller uh, glass is on page 240, that it's still the same amount of water, it's just in a taller glass. Part of that's because their language is still developing. Their cognitive ability is still developing. Be sure that you know the difference between assimilation and accommodation. I know we talked about this, but just a reminder, I happen to notice it was on the matching. Assimilation is when you're acquiring new knowledge. Like when we talked about the eight month old learns the word doll for the dog that runs around in the house. So now they have a new word. They're assimilating that information into, you know, whatever cognitive schema they are developing at that time. And then, so we've got the miniature poodle running around in the house and then they go visit somebody else and they've got the Great Dane and they call that dog. So to start with, they assimilated dog. Now they've got to accommodate this creative new information and find a place for it. When I try to remember this, okay, maybe you'll think this is ridiculous. Probably already think I am anyway. But you have to find a place, accommodations, a place for the information to sleep or to live. So I always remember that this is the, the creative information that you're trying to tie to what you already have in your mind. You have to find a place for it to sleep so it can be put into your knowledge that you already have. Get it in there. You didn't need that tip. Okay, so in Europe, page 243, you ever heard of the Heinz dilemma? A woman was near death. Her husband Heinz tried to go to the druggist and buy the medicine that could save his wife. 
So the druggist paid 200 for the radium and charged 2000 for a small dose of the drug. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that way when I go to the doctor. It's like, really? Why does that cost that much? My arthritis medication is $1,200 for three months. It's not made of gold. How do other people pay that? I'm, for some reason, I have a coupon that they use, and I actually don't have to. I have a zero copay. My insurance has to pay some of it. I don't understand all that. But how is that that I get medication that is $400 a month, and I don't have to pay anything? And how can those pills cost that much? You know they don't cost that much to make. Right? Okay. For one or four? It's $400 for one month. So 30 day supply. And so if I'm an older person and I'm going to get my medication and if I'm maybe on Medicare, I don't think you qualify for the coupon that somebody gave, that my doctor gave me. So what do you think the elderly people do? You don't have to go without it. They go without it. Yeah, and now mine is, is to prevent further damage to my joints, which obviously I need at my age. But an 80-year-old is going to say, well, I'm not going to live, you know, how much longer am I going to live anyway? I'm not going to worry about it. I know an inhaler refill is like 130 bucks. Yeah. What kind of refill? An inhaler. Inhaler. Um, it's just unreal. So kind of think about Heinz and how you feel, you know, Kind of think about that. Um, so Hans went and he got together half of it and he asked, will you sell it to me for a thousand and I'll get you the other thousand when I can. And the druggist said, no, I discovered the drug and I'm going to make money from it. So Hans broke into the drugstore and stole the um, drug from his wife. Okay. Why am I telling you this story? Because based on the response that people give, we can get an idea of how far along their moral development is. So they talk about the different levels of reasoning that goes with it. Because the first thing I want to know every time I read this is, did he leave the $1,000? Because to me, that would make a difference. It's still wrong to break in and steal. I'm not saying that. But I feel like the pharmacist is being a thief, too. You don't have a... You don't believe the pharmacist would be a thief of a wife, but they use the people of the drug. See, she has high moral reasoning. You're definitely at the post-conventional level. Yeah. Because you went further and you gave a different reason that wasn't even alluded to. That was actually a really good answer. But we also would not expect that type of answer from an elementary school age child. So when you're trying to figure out, did this four-year-old really, or fourth grader, sorry, did this fourth grader really understand that pushing Sue off the top of the jungle gyms could have endangered her life. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll tell them the story and see how they respond so we can tell, you know, how much of it do they understand has to do with their morals. Kind of get a judgment of what they think is right and wrong. Sometimes they use this when kids have to um, be uh, witnesses in court or have to give testimony so that we can kind of have an idea of how far along their moral reasoning is. Just saying, because if it's still, if you've got someone who can give that kind of response, then you know that that person understands morals in a different way than a fourth grader or even a 14-year-old. Because, you know, you still haven't completely finished developing your morals at 14. We still haven't finished completely developing them today because they're, they're in constant development, even for me, even though I'm 51. Yeah, I'm kind of past the um, emerging adulthood. I'm in middle adulthood now. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so attachment. Why is attachment so important? Think about that. We're going to come back to that after we just think about this. So they did this experiment, and this is like one they talk about in every psychology book, in every psychology class. It has importance. So they had baby monkeys, and they assumed that their theory was that the monkeys would become more attached to the wire mama monkey because she is the one that has the bottle and she gives them food. So they figured the monkeys would form an attachment with that one. Okay, this is the mama monkey wrapped in soft, soothing, comfortable cloth. And which mom and monkey did the babies go to? Most often. The warm one. They formed an attachment with that one. When they were upset, when they were sleepy, you know, if they were just uh, middle of the day hanging out, they were more likely to cling to this mama monkey and form an attachment with it. Yes, they ate from this one, but they formed an attachment with this one. This was uh, before um, autism was um, actually a diagnosis. You know, that's a relatively new diagnosis in the 1980s. And in my undergrad psychology book, when I was taking, I, had, I took a whole course on developmental psychology, um, the theory, one of the theories about what causes autism was the refrigerator parents. Refrigerator parents are middle to upper class parents who do not know how to communicate and form a bond or attachment with their children. They're cold. So that was actually one of the beginning theories of the um, cause of autism. We know that's not true now, but it was a new disorder and they were trying to figure out what caused it. And it was actually more common in middle to upper class families when it first started being diagnosed. But why might that have been? because those were the parents who could afford to take their children to specialists, to psychologists and mental health professionals. Whereas people who might have had a child who had autism, it was such a new disorder, they were probably just, you know, diagnosed as mentally handicapped or uh, communication disorder or different things. And their parents probably couldn't afford to take them to see the specialist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Furthermore, they probably also couldn't afford to take the time off from work to take their children to see those specialists. That's another thing that interferes with healthcare for children. That's why there's better health care for families that are upper middle class and upper class because those parents can, you know, take time off from work. Whereas people who are paid by the hour, lower middle, uh, lower income, a lot of times they can't afford to take time off from work to take their kids to the doctor. First of all, they can't afford the doctor. Second of all, it's also, you know, missing work. So it's like a double whammy as far as the cost. So that's why there were more children from those economic groups being diagnosed. It's something to really think about because in the next few chapters, we're gonna be talking about mental health. And that's the big, one of the big hot topics everywhere right now is mental health, mental health accessibility. Why are there so many people um, struggling with depression and unfortunately ending in suicide when there's mental health available? mental health assistance available. And part of it is because they may be from those lower income families and they don't have easy access. So, for example, therapists are starting to have later hours. Some counselors have, you know, have appointments on Saturdays, different things like that to try and accommodate the different um, economic groups. Something to think about. Do you agree with that? Disagree? 
about that. Okay, so secure attachment on page 244 um, describes children who get upset when their mothers leave. They seek interaction with the mother when she returns and they're easily comforted by the mother. Those are babies who are securely attached. So they tested this using the strange, stranger situation. They would put mom, and this was done in 1978, so it was mom. Mom and their kid in a room with a stranger, and mom and the kid and the stranger would kind of play with toys and maybe talk a little bit. And then they would have the mom leave the room, and they would watch and see how the child reacted. Would, could the child be comforted by the stranger? Could the child just kind of soothe themselves? And then when the mom returns, how does the child react? So if they were securely attached, they might have fussed a little bit, but they were able to be soothed or distracted. They, you know, wanted the mom to talk to them or hug them or pat them or whatever when, they, when she returned and they were easily comforted by the mother. The next two are insecure attachment. Avoidant attachment are not distressed when the mother leaves. They play, play by themselves and they ignore the mother when she returns. Okay, when you see a you know one to two year old who reacts that way when their primary caregiver leaves, they don't really care when the mom leaves or primary caregiver leaves. They don't care when they return. That's an indication of an insecure attachment. And it's called avoidant attachment. They pretty much avoid interaction with the mom. That's really common when mothers suffer from postpartum depression. Um, if a mother is suffering from postpartum depression, a lot of times she will overcompensate and cling to the baby because she feels like the more time she spends with the baby, then she'll somehow magically she'll get all those great feelings you're supposed to have that she doesn't have naturally because she's going through so many um, other issues at the time or she pushes the baby away because you know she doesn't really have a, a good attachment good relationship with the baby all right and then you have ambivalent resistance have you ever tried to pick up a like an eight month old or a 12 month old and they go stiff on you like, throw their heads back and they're like stiff and you have to carry them like this <laughs> no yes ever seen that that's worse than when they're you know like kicking and screaming because then you can't kind of hard to hold them so these um infants kids show severe signs when the mother leaves but then when she returns they're kind of ambivalent they can't decide if they want to hug her or push her away do they want to hug her or push her away okay so they're kind of ambivalent and resistant at the same time they really don't care when she leaves and then when she comes back they want to you know they want to be comforted by her but they don't and that's what happens when you have um, for example infants, toddlers, who are constantly being left with different people. Sometimes that can't be helped. But if you've got a toddler or let's say a 14 month old, when they're dropped off at daycare by a grandparent and they're picked up at daycare by an aunt and then they're dropped off at daycare by the mom. So they think the mom's going to pick them up, but then they don't see the mom again for two or three days. Maybe it's because of work schedule. I don't mean that the mother's doing it intentionally. But it's going to be very difficult for that 14-month-old to have attachment with the mother because they can't trust her to come back when she leaves. So um, it can, it, this can be a real issue, and it can lead into issues even as adults. Um, for example... Uh, secure children are happier, more sociable, and more cooperative with parents. They get along better with their peers and are better adjusted in school. Well, of course, they have secure attachments. They know that no matter what happens, that person's going to be there for them. Okay, insecure attachment, which can be either avoidant or ambivalent, resistant, um, can lead to psychological disorders during adolescence. 
can lead to depression because why didn't my mom care enough? Or, you know, they don't have a secure attachment with their caregiver, so then they don't know how to have a friendship. Okay, and that's really important, especially when you're a teenager, feeling like you can get along with other people. Um, also, they may not do as well in school. If the parents, if the child feels ambivalent feelings toward the parent, then they're going to be ambivalent about their performance in school. Mom doesn't really seem to care about me, so therefore she doesn't really care about my grades, so they don't do as well. Okay, and when you, as emerging adults, are trying to form a relationship, how do you think that might impact a relationship? It's kind of like that um, significant other who says, I can't believe you want to go out with your friends instead of me. I can't believe you don't want to just stay home with me. You must like your friends more than you like me. I thought this was a serious relationship. And then, so the person cancels their plans and goes and stays with the significant other. And then that person, you know, has their earbuds in and is playing a video game or doesn't even acknowledge that person's, you know, that, that they're there. Instead of making plans, they just want them there. Because it's kind of like, I want you here, but I really don't want to do anything with you. Do you know adults like that? Yeah, it's probably because they didn't have a good attachment when they were young. And that can really come in to affect families when they adopt. If the child's two or three and never had an opportunity to form a secure attachment, it's very hard for them to form an attachment with their adoptive parents. We see that a lot um, when, when um, toddlers and preschool age kids are adopted. Um, it can be overcome, but it's going to be more of a challenge, and they have to be aware of this. Okay, so um, sandwich generation. How many of you have parents who are in this situation? I'm in this. I'm a sandwich generation. So I'm still taking care of my kids. Not as much as I did when they were younger, but still, I'm still taking care of my kids. And I am also have power of health attorney, um, power uh, to go in and do financial stuff for my parents. So I'm sandwiched between caring for my parents and my kids. Sorry, page 256. Okay, I have, well, my son's 20, my daughter's 17. How much do you think they won't be interfering in their life? There are sometimes resistance to my advice. Surprise, surprise. Okay, how much do you think my mother wants me to be involved calling her doctor, making her bank transactions, taking care of things for her? Not at all. She's also resistant. So I am stuck between two pieces of bread filled with thorns, so to speak. How's that for an analogy? Anybody have parents, or maybe you have to help your parents take care of elderly people, or you've seen this in other families? It can be very difficult. My parents live three and a half hours away, and when I go there, I feel guilty because I'm not at home. And when I stay home, I feel guilty because I'm not there on the weekend. So it can be it can be challenging. That's definitely a challenge that I face. I suspect that you're going to face that when you become an adult because people are living longer, which is a great thing. But it also means that um, they're going to live longer, but they're physically not going to be able to do some of the things they used to be able to do. My mother can't do, has a medical condition. She can't do a lot of things. And my dad is five years older and he can only do so much. You know, I mean, he's 82. You got to give him a break every now and then. He's really not up for mowing the yard and vacuuming the house all in one day, like he used to be. Successful aging. Don't you want to live successfully? Age successfully. Okay, so this is especially talking about people later in life 
But it's also about reshaping your lives to concentrate on what they find to be important and meaningful. So I told my class yesterday, do you think that I'm going to have empty nest syndrome next year when my daughter's going to college and my son is going to college? Have your parents gone through that? Maybe not yet. Or they're dreading it if you're planning to transfer? Empty nest syndrome? Or whoever raised you. Sorry, I should say caregiver. Okay, right now today, I'm like, heck no. My husband and I are already trying to figure out where we can go, what we can do differently. Yeah, we're making plans. Now, obviously, we're going to be going to see them some on weekends, and they'll be coming home. And some weekends, he will be going to help take care of his dad, and I will be going to help take care of my parents. But there's going to be some other times when we get to eat what we want for dinner. We can, you know, do things that we want to do when we want to. We don't have to take their schedule into account. Okay, but, you know, I do a lot with my daughter. I did a lot with my son when he was at home. I do a lot with my daughter. We vol we've volunteered for over a year at the animal shelter. You know, um, if she pole vaults in the spring, I have to drive her because you can't drive under 18 with the pole on top of your car. It's real fun. Yeah, she pole vaults. Put the pole in the hole, jump over the bar. And I have to take it and have this big thing where I tie it on the top of my car. It's really attractive. So we end up spending a good bit of time together. Mm. Parents bought a lake house when I moved up. When I got married, three weeks later, my mother had my bedroom redone as a dining room. And I was the baby. Obviously, she didn't suffer too much. Obviously, your parents were, they were, sorry, they were all broke up. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you get to go to the lake house? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. But, no, they just told me I can't do that. Like, we can't show up. What? I'm like, at this point, they're just impulsively buying. Impulsively buying. And that's what my husband has told me because I am, he says I'm an emotional <clears throat> shopper. Can you believe he would say that about me? I mean, that's not too good of a budget, too. They're like, they haven't even, they haven't even they haven't got it yet. I think it's just hard on because, like, I don't know what I'm going to see. Like, like, so you were the first? Yeah, and you were the girl. Yeah. Yeah. You have a different relationship. Okay. Um, so don't oh, one more thing before we before we go. So they talk about crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. They talk a lot about cognitive development in children, but crystallized intelligence, I don't know if any of you have ever been in the underground caves where they had the stagolites, or maybe you've seen, you know, like ice, you know, when it gets real icy, the ice crystals. Okay, that's like crystallized intelligence. It's there. It's not going away. Like in the underground caves, you know, those are not going away. They've been there for hundreds of years and they're going to stay there. That's like the knowledge that you have in your brain that you have practiced and rehearsed and it's like the foundation for your for everything that you know okay fluid intelligence is learning new stuff it's ongoing you are right now at the peak of your fluid intelligence because you have all this crystallized knowledge from elementary school and middle school and all your memories and you are because your brain is entering its final stages of growth, you also can easily learn new information. That's why you're in college. It doesn't feel like it, especially when you're in biology, I know, but it's easier for you to learn new information, which is called fluid, okay? How many of you have ever tried to help an older person um, put a phone number in a cell phone or set a DVR? or even set the clock in their car when the time changes. 
and it is in, they have no clue. Mm -hmm. Most of my family with my uncle and my aunts. Yes, yes, absolutely. My mom absolutely refuses to look at the computer. So if I send emails or pictures, she won't look at them. I'm expected to print a copy of a picture and bring it if it's that important. <laughs> I'll say, look, I pulled out the curtains. You've been wanting curtains, and I think I just found them. Would you like to look at these? No, just order them, and if I don't like them, I'll send them back. She wants nothing to do with technology. She's 78 years old. She's lived all her life, and she doesn't want to learn something new. And I think part of that is because it's so scary to her because it is harder to learn new things as you get older, <coughs> and it makes her feel not smart. Now, my dad, he's all about it. He's got a cell phone, he's, uh, he's on the computer, they have internet. I mean, he does a lot of things online. Um, crystallized, so my mom's only sister was visiting. That's really her only living family member on her side of the family. She was visiting, it's the first time she's been in, here in three years. And they were talking about all of their memories. They were talking about classmates in Germany. They were talking about um, there's this picture that they have when they were both, I don't know, elementary school age and they had done their hair real special and it's black and white and they were talking about what color those sweaters were. They remembered that. That's crystallized information. But my aunt who was visiting has not been around my great niece, which is my mother's great granddaughter, and she could not remember her name. She knew who she was trying to talk about, but learning that new name because she hasn't been around her and it's new is very hard. So do not be offended if you have a grandchild or a great grandchild and they can't remember their name because learning new information takes longer. They can learn, but it takes more effort and it takes more time. Whereas then you're gonna be really frustrated because they can remember 10 other classmates from first grade and you're like you can't remember this new name but yet you still remember all those people from your past that's because that's crystallized information those memories have been in there for a long time and they've been rehearsed and they've been retrieved over and over and over and the new information fluid intelligence hasn't hasn't been stored that long so it takes some longer to learn it kind of makes sense don't take it personally when they don't remember your name. That's why it takes me longer to learn your names than it does Miss Morrell, because there's an age difference. My fluid intelligence doesn't work as well as someone in their 20s and 30s. That's my excuse, right? All right, so be sure that you might want to go ahead and do the chapter nine matching. There's two matching and then the quiz. Um, they'll be for Tuesday, but we'll be starting chapter 10. Do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Read chapter 10 before you come to class. Don't forget to look at your oven. What are we going to do? What are we going to do?